my name's Andy Pollard, I'm the Senior EPA Delivery Manager at Pearson, and I'll be taking you through the flexibilities which have been agreed between IFAT and the external quality assurance provider, NSAR. Okay, so if I just give you a little bit of background to the temporary flexibilities. So as a result of COVID-19, the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education had to add a range of standards whereby EPA assessment components cannot be undertaken in a safe in a safe manner. It was quickly identified that observation was the key component whereby assessment could not be undertaken and that was through various reasons, whether it is a, an independent endpoint assessor not being able to go out on site, whether there are, were employer restrictions and as a result a task force was set up to address this issue because ultimately what we don't want to do is leave apprentices um, who are close to achieving their endpoint assessment without uh, an achievement outcome. So the task forces included uh, a number of endpoint assessment organisations, it included a representative from IFAT and it also included some industry representatives alongside the external quality assurance provider NSAR and part of those task forces was to discuss, agree and identify the most fair and valid method of ensuring that apprentices get assessed in accordance with the assessment plan. So the EPAs that we're going to talk about this morning are the supply chain warehouse level two and the supply chain operator, the traffic office strand. So the temporary flexibility, um, IFA have indicated this on their website and also on NSAR's website there is additional guidance which has been provided to Pearson and other endpoint assessment organisations to make sure that our assessment materials are in line with what was agreed and ultimately ensure that the apprentice achieves a, a fair assessment. So the flexibility for both strands includes a witness testimony which is completed by an occupational expert and we'll in the later slides we'll explore who occupational experts are and how we categorise them. There will then be a professional discussion with an independent endpoint assessor and this will last for one hour with a plus or minus 10 percent um, increase at the discretion of the assessor. The reason we've included a 10% tolerance is if the apprentice is providing some uh, detailed verbal response after the 60 minutes, we're still allowing that apprentice to finish the sentence and in effect positively mark the apprentice. Now one of the conditions that all endpoint assessment organisations have to adhere to is all the distinction criteria must be discussed between the independent endpoint assessor and the apprentice and the reason for that is to confirm reliability and also validity. So this applies to the observation component only. The tester component is still available through employer-based invigilation which there is additional information and instructions which can be found on ACE 360 within the knowledge base and I'll be directing you to that section of ACE 360 later on in the presentation. So the guidance just to give you a little bit more background. So NSAR the EQA provider allowed endpoint assessment organisations to access assessors locally so that was from the employer if there was a qualified assessor within the apprentice's own workplace they could undertake an observation on behalf of Pearson and then submit that to the independent endpoint assessor. We did explore this option with uh, key training providers to see if there were occupationally uh, qualified assessors on site and then Pearson would undertake a fast track independent endpoint assessor training. However with the latest confirmation 
we can now use any witness, any occupationally competent person within the organisation to complete the observation template. So the person who's providing the observation evidence has been trained in assessment requirements. So part of today's presentation and slides is to explore what is required, what the procedure is for the witness, because the witness will be the independent endpoint assessor's eyes and ears to help inform the independent endpoint assessor around the professional discussion. And as always, we've got to maintain uh, the integrity of assessment decisions. So we've got to confirm that there's no conflict of interest which can which can risk this. The web link at the bottom will take you directly to the COVID-19 guidance from NSAR. But in Pearson's um, redevelopment of assessment materials and processes, we have ensured that every element of the guidance has been addressed. And as part of that, this is where this uh, presentation has come from. So what does the witness testimony need to include? So the witness testimony must demonstrate how the apprentice has demonstrated the relevant knowledge, skills and behaviours across various criteria. Now, I am going to show you an extract of the assessment documentation. And when we start looking at that assessment documentation, it will become more clearer in terms of how we need the witness to record what they have seen the apprentice do. There are some situations which can cover many criteria, and this is what one of the key things. Holistic, holistic achievement should be key. We're not asking for individual activities to meet each individual criteria. It should be a, a naturally occurring observation. We do need to evidence dates when the apprentice has been observed. Again, that is just for authenticity and validity purposes. And the witness is free to write their account, type their account, or even audio record their account. What we don't want to do is make it too onerous for the witness, but at the same time, same time maintain the quality of evidence which is being provided. And the key thing with quality is having clear, justified statements as opposed to a, a, a as opposed to reams and reams of evidence which doesn't specifically demonstrate how the apprentice has met the, the relevant criteria. So regardless of which pathway the witness is observing the apprentice on, the instructions remain the same. So we've got two columns, one for mandatory criteria. So this is what the apprentice must demonstrate to achieve a minimum of a pass. And then we've also got the distinction criteria. Now to make it clear and explicit, where a criteria doesn't hold a distinction criteria, this will be shaded gray. So when evidence is demonstrated against a skills outcome, a statement is required in the relevant criteria box. And as I mentioned previously, that evidence must give enough detail for Pearson's independent endpoint assessor to make a robust assessment judgment. For all apprentices who will be using this flexibility, 100% IQA sampling will occur because we are using an employer witness to support the assessment process. The independent endpoint assessor will be holding a professional discussion, but from a quality perspective, 100% of all apprentices using this flexibility will be sampled. In some instances, if apprentices are unable to demonstrate the performance evidence, there may be opportunity to ask a question. And what we've done is we've indicated this within the documentation as to where questions can, can be asked. To further support the distinction criteria, we've also included distinction targeted questions. And again, these can be asked in the relevant places in amongst the different skills outcomes, 
but also after individual activities. Just to give you an example, the apprentice does have the choice of either achieving skill outcome 7.2 or 7.3. And again, this depends on what was observed during the day, the apprentice's uh, normal work routine. So all mandatory criteria needs to be completed to achieve a pass. And for a distinction, apprentices must achieve all pass criteria and a minimum of the 10 distinction performance criteria to be awarded a distinction in this component. So this is just an extract of the warehouse operative assessment plan. So you can see this is related to skill area one, operate at least one vehicle safely and efficiently. So we, the employer witness needs to be observing the apprentice, checking the safety of at least one vehicle and looking at the performance criteria. So for number one, carry out pre-operative checks on vehicles in line with organizational requirements. And we can see that criteria 1.1 and 1.2 is a pass only. So in the middle column where we've got the white box, the employer witness will need to provide justified comments to confirm how the apprentice has completed the checks in accordance with the vehicle and organisational requirements. And then in 1.2, record vehicle preoperative checks. Now, depending on what the apprentice has done during the employer witness observation, the employer witness could include 1.1 and 1.2 together. Now, if this happens as we go through, we're not expecting the employer witness to copy and paste into each individual uh, box. What we do ask empl uh, employer witnesses to do is indicate if something has been achieved in a different criteria. So just as an example, 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 is covered. In the middle column for 1.1, the employer witness provides justified statements to show how 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2 is met. And then in the mandatory pass box for 1.2, the employer witness will need to reference C 1.1. Again, we need to keep in mind that the employer witness will be the independent endpoint assessor's eyes and ears. And from an audit perspective, we need to be able to confirm that the apprentice has demonstrated these performance criteria and therefore demonstrated the skills and behaviours that's required. But ultimately, the employer witness needs to be able to signpost the independent endpoint assessor to show where the evidence can be found for each criteria. As I mentioned previously, where we're looking at um, questions, so in section seven, Point one, point three. the employer witness will need to ask the apprentice a question. So I have seen you do, and that would relate to whatever activity the employer witness has observed the apprentice undertaking. How would you adjust the equipment? And based on the apprentice's responses, the employer witness would need to record this accurately. Now, if an employer witness is using a, a audio recording, that is absolutely fine and that can be submitted alongside this document. If an employer witness is audio recording and the apprentice provides the response to this question, again, the employer witness would just need to indicate a timestamp to show the independent endpoint assessor. The evidence for 7.13 can be found at 32 minutes. At the end of the assessment documentation, there is a question which needs to be asked to evidence distinction performance criteria. And for the purpose of security of assessment instruments, and because this has been recorded, you can see at the bottom, we haven't included a question. The question will be available on ACE360 within the knowledge base and employer witnesses will need to ask this question and again 
accurately com uh, accurately complete the document to show the independent endpoint assessor what the apprentice response was. Again, the questions are going to be directed at what the employer witness has seen the apprentice do. So it's key that the employer witness has a good understanding of what is required in the assessment document. When we move over to the supply chain operator, so the traffic strand, we've actually provided one for a better word range within each of the different core skills. So as you can see in core skill one, to be able to deliver excellent customer service, we've actually included some information for the witness. We've clarified the term customers, and then we've also included what the witness must observe the apprentice undertaking. So it's, it's key in terms of planning between the employer witness and the apprentice that they choose a appropriate time where the apprentice has suitable opportunity to demonstrate all the requirements within this assessment document. As you can see, the witness must observe the apprentice identifying customer need, working with colleagues, dealing with problems, and interaction with customers. We've also broken it down into different situations and also different types of examples. So again, that's giving the employer witness a overview of what the apprentice must be observed doing. We've also included some simulation scenarios. So if the skill learning outcome cannot be met through day-to-day -day activities, a simulation um, can provide apprentices the opportunity to either deal with a customer problem on the phone, deal with a customer problem face-to-face, -face, or deal with written communication from a customer with a problem. So again, it's going back to that planning. Is there going to be opportunity for the apprentice to demonstrate this skill area? If not, we can simulate a scenario in one of those three areas. So who can be a witness? So we've already mentioned that witnesses have to be occupational experts. And in the latest guidance, the occupational expert doesn't need to hold an assessor's award. But the witness must be somebody who works in first line management of the apprentice or above. So this could be a team leader, could be a supervisor, it could be a, a shift manager. We can't accept employer witnesses from somebody on the same level of the apprentice. So by that, what I mean is somebody who is on the same um, sort of level as the apprentice, it has to be the level above. The witness must have a good understanding of the apprenticeship standard. They must have a good understanding and awareness of the grade criteria and evidence requirements. So like I just mentioned previously, in some of the performance criteria, the employer witness must be able to understand and see how that applies within the apprentice's normal day-to-day -day job. In addition, the witness will also need to confirm that the account is a true reflection and also that it is a true and accurate picture of the apprentice's ability. Now, one thing to stress is that we're not expecting the expert witness to grade the evidence. Yes, we've indicated where the past criteria and the distinction criteria are. However, we're not expecting the employer witness to grade. That will be down to the independent endpoint assessor. The employer witness is providing evidence to help the independent endpoint assessor understand the apprentice's skills and behaviours during the assessment period. It will be down to the independent endpoint assessor following the professional discussion to award a grade for that component and therefore award an overall grade taking into account the test. So the employee witness has undertook the observation. They've then shared it with the trained provider to then upload onto S360. 
the independent endpoint assessor will then organize a 60 minute question and answer session. Now that 60 minute question and answer session will explore the apprentice responses in detail. So they will be looking at what the employer witness has wrote and devising a range of questions to further explore what the apprentice has done. By doing so, the independent endpoint assessor will be looking at particular activities, clarifying uh, what the employer witness has stated, but also discuss the distinction criteria. Because one of the key uh, requirements for apprentices to achieve the distinction criteria is that the independent endpoint assessor discusses all distinction criteria. And in doing this 60 minute question and answer, the independent endpoint assessor will be confirming authenticity and validity. So again, we're confirming that the grade to be awarded to the apprentice is as valid as a face-to-face -face observation. So all the documentation can be found within ACE360 Knowledge Base. So training providers at the moment who have a contract with Pearson will have access to ACE360. And when you log into ACE360, on the left hand sort of dark blue bar, you will see a magnifying glass over a piece of paper. If you click into that, it will then open up the knowledge base. The knowledge base is split into two areas. So the top area is around the general generic guidance. And then underneath, you will see the standard specific guidance. And if you select either supply chain warehouse operative or uh, the traffic office, you will be able to see that we have all the specifications and the dispensation guidance documents. So from a training provider perspective, once you have downloaded the documents from S360, share those with the employer witness. The employer witness will then need to undertake the assessment activity. Complete all uh, documentation, share it back to you as the training provider, and then you would need to then upload it into ACE360. So in terms of organizing the assessment, the training provider will upload all of the materials that the employer witness has completed. So whether it's the recordings, uh, audio recordings, or typed documents, they would need to be uploaded into the apprentice's record within the shared area. Once you've done that, if you notify EPA delivery that additional details have been uploaded, we will then inform your independent endpoint assessor. And then from that moment on, it is business as usual. The independent endpoint assessor will organize a planning meeting between the apprentice and or the employer. They will confirm dates, times, and uh, Zoom links for the 60 minute professional discussion. And then five working days after the professional discussion has occurred, the notification of results will be available within ACE 360. One of the other things just to be mindful of is the Pearson update section. So, Within the qualification pages, we are updating this um, as and when new changes come in. And as you can see on the screen, where additional flexibilities have been announced from the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, we indicate this here. Similarly, off course consultation, it's just one, it's a one stop shop to keep updated on what Pearson's stance is in relation to external changes. But similarly, any um, changes to flexibilities, we have been informed by IFIT that the flexibilities will be in place until January 2021. And as a result of that, apprentices still have the right to 
pause their uh, apprenticeship if they want a face to face observation. However, given current circumstances where travel is limited, the, fl uh, the flexibilities are there to be used. Okay, so if you do have any questions after um, this recording, please feel free to email epa delivery at pearson.com. And as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, a recording of this will be made available alongside any FAQs. So if I just pause there for a couple of moments, if anybody's got any questions, to pop them into the questions panel and then I will start answering them as we go through. Okay, so I can see a couple of questions with regards to can holistic observations carried out by assessors from the training organisation be used towards the completion of the witness testimony? Unfortunately not. One of the uh, stipulations was the employer witness has to complete this as opposed to the training organization's assessor. If we think of sort of a uh, conflict of interest, the employer witness completing a, a summary of the apprentice's um, activities and then sharing it with the independent endpoint assessor that's just giving an additional layer of sort of confirmation and similarly there seems to be a lot of work for the witness to carry out bearing in mind the apprentice will have worked over the past 14 to 16 months meeting all case uh, no skills and behaviors can previous assessments be used unfortunately not it does need to be a separate activity and because that was the consensus between endpoint assessment organisations, industry representatives, and IFAP, it does have to be a separate activity away from the on programme in training phase. 